Good evening and welcome. First things first, can I have you silence your cell phones, please? My name is David Coleman. I am the director of the Whitliffe Collections, um, and I am your master of ceremonies tonight. Um, thank you for coming to our celebration of Las Sombras, uh, The Shadows by Kate Brakey. I feel this is a very kind of family atmosphere here tonight, um, but I'm sure we have some newcomers. So can we have a show of hands of anyone who might be here for the first time this evening? Well, hey, that's terrific. <laughs> Special welcome to all of you. Um, and also to the Tucson crew, as I'm calling. We have Kate has brought a number of friends, or her entourage, uh, from Arizona. So we're very excited to have you with us uh, this evening. Um, before we begin, I'd like to recognize some special guests that we have uh, with us here tonight. Our founding donors, Bill and Sally Whitliffe. They started this collection some 26 years ago and their vision has flowered into what we have with us uh, today. We also have a couple members of the university's administration and their presence is a powerful symbol, uh, not only of their support and generosity um, of the Whitliffe Collections, but also their fidelity, you might say, because they've had to choose between coming here or going to the Texas State home football game. <laughs> versus Louisiana Tech. <laughs> Go Bobcats. The Whitliffe Collections is a special collections within the university uh, library, so I'm happy to recognize the head of the university library, uh, Associate Vice President Joan Heath. <laughs> and the library is one of three departments uh, that make up the Division of Information Technology and I'm also happy to recognize uh, the vice president of our division, uh, Dr. Van Wyatt. I said earlier that we are celebrating Las Sombras, the shadows, uh, but this is really two exhibitions in one, in case you haven't noticed. Surrounding you here in the main gallery, we have uh, over 200 life-size animals and plants uh, from the Southwest made by our intrepid photographer, Kate Brakey. Uh, she's used the camera-less uh, photogram technique for these images, which essentially means laying animals out on photographic paper and exposing it to light. It's not exactly that, but Kate will explain. Um, and she has, with some help from uh, some of us here, arranged the exhibition uh, that surrounds you tonight. Um, I can't tell you how great the reaction has been since we've un installed this show. When people walk in, uh, the word that we always hear is, is wow. It's really incredible to hear. Uh, and it really gets you, you know, to hear that. Um, but we are also uh, honored to be the debut venue for the, the two galleries in the back of the room, uh, Creatures of Light and Darkness, uh, or as Kate calls it, the uh, Spy Cam series, the unofficial <laughs> title. Uh, and these images are made with a motion sensing uh, infrared camera. Uh, we have lit these two galleries to somewhat imitate the lighting conditions in which these photographs are taken, so uh, moonlight and uh, the light of dawn, uh, respectively. And I guess I would say that when people come into this gallery, they say, wow, as I said. When they go into, especially the Coyote Gallery with the moon, it's more of a, whoa. <laughs> it's heavy. And you couldn't really get an exhibition that's more tailor-made to the mission of the Whitliffe Collections. Um, our motto is to instruct, illuminate, inspire. And all three things are here at play every day when people come in to see this show, uh, especially elementary school kids. They just love it. They love looking at these animals, trying to figure them out. Uh, and it's just really inspirational. And I hope you leave inspired yourself tonight. Uh, I also hope we can inspire you uh, to support our mission and give a donation tonight. There are donation boxes out in the foyer. Um, or consider becoming a friend of the Whitliffe Collections. The flyer that you've either sat upon or put under your chair, that's a friend's membership uh, program. 
uh, all of the money that we receive through the Friends Program goes directly to supporting uh, acquisitions and the programs that we have here at the Whitliff Collections. Tonight's program is a celebration of the newest book in our series with the University of Texas Press, uh, which I'm sure you've seen, uh, is on sale out by the bar. Uh, tonight is literally your first opportunity to buy this book uh, because they were specially air freighted from China specifically for tonight's event. After the program, both Kate and Leah Purpura, who wrote the book's marvelous introduction, will be signing uh, the books uh, at a table out front. So why not buy a book and have them sign it? Since I'm pushing book sales, uh, I will also say that we have deep discounts on uh, two other books that we have done with Kate, uh, her Small Deaths and Painted Light books. Um, and again, all the profits from our book sales go directly to supporting the mission collections and programs at the Whitliff. So uh, just to go over the program tonight, I'll introduce Leah, uh, who will talk a little bit about uh, the beginning of her relationship with Kate and then read a part of her introduction from the book. Um, and then I will introduce Kate, who will then give a wonderful talk uh, about her work. Uh, and then we will have some time for questions and then, as I said, the book signing. <coughs> Uh, but let me first thank uh, some of the people uh, who have helped make this exhibition so uh, phenomenal, really. Uh, Carla Ellard, where are you, Carla? There you are. <laughs> Carla is the curator of our Southwestern and Mexican photography collection, and it's her giving spirit and tireless dedication to our mission and to Kate's work that has helped keep us on schedule, keep us to task, uh, she's always ready. John Scott, where are you, John? Over there? Uh, John, if you don't know, framed all of these works and literally filled his house with <laughs> dead animals uh, while he was framing all of these amazing uh, pieces here. And Doug Mortensen, Doug, where are you? Way in the back. Doug uh, hung the show under what I would call extraordinary duress. Um, and by that I mean under the ever watchful eyes of Kate, uh, Carla, uh, and myself. Um, and I also hope that you'll show uh, a warm uh, round of applause for the rest of the Whitliff Collection staff and student workers, their tireless uh, and relentless passion for quality and detail always enhances what we do here. So please. Thank you. So our first speaker tonight is the author Leah Purpura. She has written seven collections of essays, poems, and translations, including On Looking, which was a finalist for the National Book Critics Circle Award in nonfiction. Her awards include a 2012 Guggenheim Foundation Fellowship, as well as an NEA and Fulbright Fellowships, and four Pushcart Prizes. Her work can be read in The New Yorker, the New Republic, Orion, and the Paris Review. She is writer in residence at the University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County, and teaches in the MFA program uh, in the Rainier Writing Workshop in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, she has written, I think it's two pieces, uh, in response to Kate Brakey's work. Do I have that right? Okay, good. Uh, the first, On Coming Back as a Buzzard, uh, which was published in Orion Magazine in 2009, uh, earned her a Pushcart Prize. And the second is just now being published uh, as the introduction to uh, our book, Las Sombras. Uh, as I said, she'll read a portion of that uh, this evening. So please join me in welcoming Leah Purpura. I am so honored to be here and um, would like to thank Bill and Sally Whitliff for throwing wide their incredibly warm embrace and inviting me to be part of this all. Um, it's, it is an, it, it, it's a true honor. Um, so I will tell you a little bit about how uh, I met Kate, which really happened hours ago. Um, and then uh, read you a 
I'll, I'll read you the essay I wrote in response uh, to this collection. I met Kate entirely by chance. We often say we stumbled upon or bumped into about such meetings, but it hardly felt that clumsy. Was I led, was I courted, or whispered to there in my university's library as I browsed? I remember pulling small deaths from the shelf and after flipping a few pages, feeling an uncanny sense of familiarity set in. Who knows why just then I chose or found myself in that spot in the stacks, killing a few minutes waiting for a ride home with my pile of checked out books. All I can say with any certainty is this. I found Kate's work the way once in a rare while I find my own poems. While walking, gazing out a window, or eating a sandwich aimless and open, I turn toward, or am turned, and I'm aware of a meeting happening. And even as it's happening, I know it's complete, a gift, a surprise, an awakening. As a writer, it's my responsibility to take such chance meetings seriously, to work with them to make something of them. So I added small deaths to my teetering pile and took it home. I lived with Kate's work very much the way I live with those gift poems, suddenly delivered into my possession. I sat with her photographs for a long time, again and again experiencing moments of first arrival. Eventually, such poems are packed up and sent out for publication. So too did I eventually write to Kate. And here's a part of that letter. I won't read the whole thing. It's very gushy. This is uh, June 8th, 2009. Dear Kate Brakey, we are very formal at first with these, with these things. Um, one of my first reactions to your photographs was this. I felt certain I had seen these gestures before. It's not just that I was moved to apply my known world or contexts or pull from my store of references to account for my understanding, but rather your work suggested that certain states of being are a priori, that formal stances in the world, like wisdom or desolation, <coughs> are transfigured or enacted by other creatures and remain utterly recognizable and we share these forms of composure. In death, these gestures are quieted, calmed, held. There isn't in your work the parable-like coolness of Dutch still life, nor is there a rampant lushness that wants to suggest a rich world beyond. It seems to me that death reveals the vulnerability of these creatures, not because they're dead and gone and wow, isn't the body fragile, but because in death they are slowed enough to be seen fully. And the form of seeing that a contemporary viewer actually employs, the kind that is so rushed, is itself called into question, challenged and resisted. And I went on and on and on. While I work with words, and Kate with light and shadow and actual paint, paper, chemicals, and the bodies of creatures, I sense that our interests converged in powerful ways. What follows, and while, what I'll read in, in a second, uh, is an essay I wrote for the occasion of Las Sombras. It's a piece that Kate's work made possible evidence of what her art and vision stirred into motion and into being. Most importantly, it's meant as an homage to Las Sombras, a close reading of her work and a record of the magic it performs and the mystery it articulates for this viewer. In the best artistic friendships, and as I mentioned, this is uh, the first time Kate and I met. We sort of threw our arms around each other. Uh, work begets work and demands conversation. It fires you up, challenges, urges, asks you to see and seek harder. It makes you want to write or paint or dance better. It makes you want to drop everything, 
clear all distractions and get to work immediately and not let up. Some art is made to be studied up close. Joseph Cornell's intimate worlds come to mind and the wildly imaginative precisions of Hieronymus Bosch. And some is meant to be viewed at a distance, Byzantine mosaics, for example. Casework in La Sombra suggests and allows both forms of attention. Come close for feathered tails of foxes, articulated bones of snake and reticulate leaf tips. Move back a bit to observe the attitude of dance you'd never known a fox to exhibit. To see a bird stilled yet in flight, a rabbit in a moment of petition, whose life must have been marked at times by just this posture, some form of private, joyful exhilaration. To see intimately is to experience the shimmer between the close at hand and the hard to reach, to take the measure of a creature both alive in the moment and already gone. Kate's profoundly engaged eye and hand grant passage to these most deeply human, hard to pin states of being. And here's the essay uh, I wrote in response to the collection. It's called On Shadows, Some Investigations. What's in a shadow? Surely not the stories colors tell. How a lock of hair honeys or silvers in sunlight. How one might think on a hot crowded subway, hey, you have my grandmother's high burnished cheekbone. Don't leave, stay with me a moment longer. A shadow won't glow like the tender pink underside of a starfish. It won't shine like a translucent chip of beach glass worn to a penny-sized lozenge. Its contours can't cloud the way late summer plums gather white bloom, nor iridesce like a cicada's wings marking the turn of the season with song. A shadow can't bronze a dry leaf in fall, though true enough, like a leaf, it's not got long to live either. A shadow's a threshold, a rehearsal for leaving. It begins by leaning sharply west, at noon reduces to barely a puddle, and by dusk reconstitutes, holding its breath until finally disappearing low and thin in the east. A shadow, intending to stay in motion, ends up by way of its restlessness gone. All passionate makers of atmosphere use themselves up entirely. How then does one move through the world as a shadow? Gently. Remember, though ever hinged to the body, it's not of the body and is easily, easily overcome by and dissolved into the darkness of tree, building, or truck. Read carefully the postures of others' shadows, hunched wings, arched back, a bristling in the shoulders, for clues to expressions clarified and distilled. Consider a shadow as a tidy leak, a spot of spilled ink, a night lake. Or if one who is fluent in transformation, in transformations reverses the process, it's a leak or spill or pooling of light that fits its own contours perfectly, stays contained, and won't crest its banks. How independent sh a shadow seems, how different, too, than a bold outline whose center fills with the material upon which it's sketched. A shadow asserts a kind of absence. Yet if held, say, in a photograph, a plumed tail, ragged paws, pointed ears are saturated with presence. Remember your first shadow as a kid when you tried to leap away and it stuck and stayed and confirmed the very ground of you as inescapable? How original and strange that discovery. And recall, by way of tricky gestures and flashlights, how you've made with your own body a menagerie, a hand folded just so is a fox opening its mouth, 
or a wrist bent with arm upright turns to swan, and hovered the images along a wall near a child's bed, or tethered to its source, say at dusk, there you are, throwing a long, thin version of joy into the street, or worry over a monument, reticence into a cornerstone's crease. Such ease, such intimacy with muddy curb, fire hydrant, pile of trash, a shadow can rest on anything. So deftly fill the space it's poured into, a light on dry land or water or rock, and leave not a print at all. Pass over and leave not a trace. Shadows suggest the line between death and sleep is terribly fragile, mysteriously easeful. How else does a shadow speak? Besides allowing a refinement of gestures, a pairing to essentials, a concentration, an intensification, shadows are tests of specialized seeing. At what micro moment does a subject's bearing turn from noble to grief, from the simple bent to a task to the more discreet shouldering a weight, from hide and seek counting to praying? With shadows, it, it's not so much a matter of looking straight into as one might in returning a frank gaze. It's more about recognizing inclinations. A shadow confirms your intuition. Look up from your work and see in the merest tilt of your beloved's head projected there against the wall, degrees of mood signaling something has changed. A voice can override and insist, but the body's inflection doesn't lie. The body will magnetize toward truth, bending away from the things it despises, leaning instinctively toward all it desires. A shadow can't contain its delight, and a shadow reveals what a brave smile's been hiding. The art of shadows suggests light can be whittled and darkness sculpted, both arranged so essential states of being might speak. Reconsider the popular stance towards shadows, that they represent darkness, which is, as all cliches are, too easy. The evil dark versus the pure light of good. It's hard to stop thinking of shadows this way, what with language like shadowy and overshadowed, in the shadows, shadowed by. Couldn't there be, in a shadow, a commodious dark, an exhilarant, choiring, rounded ease? A photogram's white shadow might be a fox made of sunlight, a bombardment of dawn in the shape of a rabbit, a dove by habit fledged against evening for an instant at home in its body before startling away. In whichever way a shadow's conceived, it constitutes a form of relief. The eye can sink into it, relax and unfocus, no pixels apparent or zillions of tiny concentrates zinging. The idea of a kitchen table being full of atoms constantly moving isn't all that easy to live with. And though it is in mad motion, according to theory, it's best that we agree to its heft and roughness, its weight and stillness, to know our table as a reliable object. A shadow, too, is reliable and steady. You can, if you make a study of such things, glimpse it in the dark we all share that we're all heading toward in the shape of a snake, a hare, a crow taken from flight by who knows what force <coughs> and arranged and held here by a gifted hand. Such a hand lends a javelina repose, a sea kelp caught mid-wave elegance. Wherever a thing is slowed and regarded, its body filled and core made animate, its most essential self is redeemed. And we who come to it are shown again how to see. <laughs> Thank you, Kate.
And thank you, Leo. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Kate Brakey. Uh oh. Well, you, well, come on up. <laughs> Originally hailing from South Australia, she then came to the University of Texas at Austin, where she earned her MFA and also taught in the photography program. Uh, she has since moved to Arizona, uh, but we in Central Texas are fortunate to be able to hold on to her, at least in some way, uh, because the Whitliffe Collections holds the largest collection of her work anywhere. Her works have appeared in more than 70 one-person exhibitions and more than 50 group exhibitions in Australia, China, France, Japan, New Zealand, the UK, and the United States. Now I can say, I have worked with photographers for nearly 20 years, and I can honestly say that working with Kate on the installation of this show was one of the most rewarding experiences I've had. Challenging, but rewarding. And now we can all say, we did it, and we all get to hear those amazed woes and wows for the next several months. Kate Brakey. I'm going to do this right, change the slide. Okay, so um, first of all, uh, Leah wrote this beautiful thing in one of her last collections of essays, a book called On Looking, and I was so blown away when I read this because it summed up very poetically exactly how I feel as an artist looking at the natural world and pretty much why I make art. So I knew that I wanted to ask her to write uh, this was after she sent me a book after she'd written to me. Um, I knew I wanted to ask her to write for La Sombres and very luckily she agreed and it's just such an honour to have had her do that and um, uh, if you haven't, I have here, I'm just going to do a, I have her book here. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Someone stole it. <laughs> okay. okay, so this is her last collection of essays. And if you like what you just heard, you've got to read this. It's just extraordinary. Okay, um, I'm going to start by thanking a whole lot of people. Can you read that? Um, so this is just thank you to everyone at UT Press, including Dave Hamrick, Theresa May, Lynn Chapman, Regina Fuentes, uh, Alison Faust, Nancy... Brian, and particularly Ellen Mackey, who uh, was so patient with all my nitpicking over this book, and I wanted to thank her for not letting me use fonts like these. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to thank all the people at the Whitliffe Collection, particularly Carla Ellard, who's always so calm and enthusiastic and accommodating, and Michelle Miller, who helps me write better, um, another poet. Um, and David Coleman, who totally accepted my vision of how this was all going to go together on the walls. But at one stage, he said to me, when I was still switching things around at the very last minute, he said, Kate, you're driving me to drink. <laughs> so I have something here for David. <laughs> Which is a very nice bottle of tequila. Just to enable that. <laughs> You're not allowed to drink it on campus, though, OK? Um, so I, I can't tell you how grateful I am for this opportunity to be part of the Whitliffe Collection and to have had my career as an artist so significantly changed by the generosity of Bill and Sally, um, who are my dear friends. Um, I don't have an image of Sally, but I've got a couple of images of Bill. And here's Bill Whitliffe front and Bill Whitliffe back. <laughs> Um, and this is how I know him best, really, is with a ca pinhole camera in his hand. And he's, he came out a couple of times to help uh, get this book together and fell in love with saguaro cactuses in, in Tucson and started to do, uh, to photograph saguaros and is apparently going to a whole lot more, so that's very nice. There's a whole lot more people I'm going to thank along the way, but I'll, I'll wait. I'll just uh, show you some more things. Um, so I come from this very small country town right on the Southern Ocean um, of South Australia here. And I also want to say to all you Texans is that South Australia is like this 
and it's literally three times bigger than Texas. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, and actually, it's way safer because because we've got about half a, a dozen guns between us in South Australia. So anyway, uh, this is you know, but what I love about Australia is the great outdoors and the beautiful creatures and. As I said, born out there with not very much around. Um, our good friend Michael Klovanik with his big camera. Uh, so, anyway, um, I was raised by wolves, <laughs> and as soon as I could, I ran away with my horse and I joined the circus. <laughs> And I'm um, being very silly, um, but I did have an extremely sort of strange, uh, wonderful uh, upbringing and a, rather an eccentric family. Um, I had a lot of uh, backyard full of animals. Many of them were rescue animals. There were motherless lambs that I liked to mother and um, just many, many critters all the time. I had uh, other rescue people in my family, including my aunt and uncle, that's an Australian uh, possum, we call them possums, they're not opossums, they're ringtail possums. Um, and this was my aunt and uncle way back, I guess in the 40s, when they used to race motorbikes um, cross country. My uncle is the one that looks like Kramer out of Seinfeld. <laughs> but, uh, but they had the most adventurous life, um, they actually travelled around Australia uh, before there were any roads at all. That's an anthill, by the way. And they shot uh, Super 8 movies of all of this, uh, which I've inherited. Um, so he actually made, yes, he made all these movies of their trips. And uh, the other thing they did was rescue all these animals. And so there was always all these animals uh, that shouldn't really that's a small kitten, a black kitten, it's kind of hard to see, and a magpie, an Australian magpie that are actually playing with each other. So all these animals kind of coexisted in this house and in this backyard, and as I said, I grew up amongst this animals that didn't actually know what they were because uh, they'd grown up being mothered by something else. These are these lizards that we call sleepy lizards um, that they used to bring in when it got too cold in the winter um, and keep them by the fire. You see one of the cats having a look. <laughs> so this is the possum again on the top of the door. One of the things they did, my aunt and uncle, they were fanatic gardeners and they grew, they crossbred roses and orchids and they were able to name them and so forth. Um, and my uncle, because he was shooting Super 8 film and taking a lot of photographs, he used to make stop frame uh, time lapse photographs of the roses opening. Um, because they were just so proud of their beautiful roses. And then the possum would eat them. <laughs> Seriously. So here's the possum, probably sharing my aunt's gin and tonic. <laughs> and here's my aunt earlier on with some big python that they picked up. Anyway, and um, they had this wombat. We have these other marsupials called a wombat. This wombat was actually so fat and lazy that they had to carry it everywhere. So <laughs> someone's mission was always to carry the wombat. Who's going to carry the wombat? <laughs> uh, anyway, my uncle had a, a makeshift dark room and he was very interested in photography. He had lots of books. He had Ansel Adams books and Edward, Wester, Edward Curtis books, Edward Weston books. And so when I was a kid, uh, you know, I'd go into the dark room and he'd watch him processing um, the paper and I witnessed, you know, all this, the magic of photography very early on and saw all of this photography out of the southwest long before I knew that I'd actually end up here. Um, oh, sorry, that's okay. Okay, next influence. So I went off to art school and um, met Paul Krieg, who's here tonight. <laughs> um, and he uh, was doing his PhD in molecular biology uh, at the university, and he'd saved up all his money for a house of blood which was a fortune to a student then. So I quickly became his girlfriend and I took the camera <laughs> and it's the very camera I actually still use to this day. We, we still have it. Um, and I'm really, uh, I mean, I'm 
sort of trying to say thank you without really saying so, but he, Paul is one of my greatest influence. He's my best critic, my best friend. He's, uh, the reason why I'm actually here in this country is because he needed to get a job in this country to get the, enough money to do the science he wanted to do, and so I came with him. So, you know, it's one of those things. I, would, I wouldn't other, uh, be here without um, him. <laughs> so the other thing is um, he, he's totally unfazed by the large numbers of dead animals that we have at all times in our kitchen or our freezer or whatever. So anyway, so my other greatest influence in life is that uh, we live now in the Sonoran Desert and these are just some snapshot pictures. This is our house out there but we live right uh, on four acres out in the desert uh, against the national park and it's very beautiful and the light's beautiful and it's uh, full of stunning things like sunsets and um, cactus and more sunsets and <coughs> giant toads and beautiful lizards and so I make photographs of all these things I find them dead and I make photographs of them uh, just because I think they're so beautiful there's a moon setting over the peak snake crossing the road which happens all the time so then this is, I'm just going to move on now to the series of work that is here tonight um, to tell you that a long time ago when I was a student of photography, um, one of the people that you learn about is uh, this woman, Anna Atkins, who was probably the very first woman photographer. And she um, was friends with uh, William Henry Fox Talbot, who for argument's sake will say invented photography. <laughs> I say looking at David, <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, she also was friends with uh, Herschel, who invented this process of cyanotype, which, again, I'm not going to go into this, but it's using uh, iron salts instead of uh, silver salts, yes. Anyway, she did, uh, she went down to the beach and she, for, for a decade, collected um, mostly algae and seaweed and did this version of photography without a camera where you lie something down on, on sensitised paper and expose it to the sun and um, did this enormous body of work all based on uh, British algae and seaweed which she self-published. Um, again, I think the, the first person to do that and I just find them so beautiful, they're otherworldly and um, I was very inspired by this so, um, of course, many, many, many people have, along the way have done photograms. Um, sorry, that was pinched off the web, so it's just got, why well, it's got the smaller view on it. Anyway, whoops. Beautiful stuff. Okay, so, I <laughs> decided I'd do my own shadows. Um, so, he here's the, the 10 easy steps. You find yourself a dead animal. And there are lots out there because there's roads and there's just natural death and so forth. You've got to get the dead animals before everything else eats them. But I've got a, great, a lot of great neighbours who call me and say there is a dead coyote on the road and I get in the car and go and get it. So then you take it home and I'm only smiling here because I feel very bad about this coyote but my friends were making such terrible fun of me that they were making me laugh and I'm on my way to put the Cody in the fridge and in fact this is not the Cody in the fridge, this is a bobcat in the fridge but um, as I said I've now had to go out and buy freezers because there aren't enough fridges in life to hold all of the big dead animals. So then you put the uh, animal, this is now transformed into a jackrabbit um, which is one of the ones over there, yeah. You put it on a piece of photographic paper under the enlarger. You can see I've got a great big enlarger um, where the baseboard go da goes down low. And um, you have to remember to turn the lights <laughs> off first. You put the paper underneath. You get ready all of the... Uh, what's perfect for this is the stock tanks you can buy in feed stores for the size that I'm doing. Um, uh, and this is where I do it outside because there's really no other room. And this is, brings me to the next person I want to thank very much. Um, this is my very, very good friend and neighbour and expert assistant Martha Smith, who is here in the front row, looking very embarrassed. Um, <laughs> Martha has been 
doing various things, but this particularly for many, many years with me and um, is, as I said, my drinking buddy, my horse riding buddy. And um, she's also extremely patient with the dead things and the smell and everything. She, in fact, gives lots of these critters names and sings songs to them while we're making the, the prints. So there's never a dull moment in the dark room. And um, she's pretty much been with me making these images and toning them and washing them. Um, as I said, every single one on this wall, she's probably had her hands on. OK, so then you let the cat sleep on them for a while. It's just so that the cat hair will stick to the emulsion. And then we tone them, more, more work outside. You can see Martha in the corner there washing. This is best not done in the 110 degree Arizona heat. <laughs> That's a, a gannet that I'm actually washing, which is also one of the ones here. I can't remember where there's that. OK. And that gannet, by the way, is a seabird. It's not obviously a Sonoran Desert critter. But Bill Whitliff um, finds me dead things. and. <laughs> freezes them and sends them to me. <laughs> Which is fantastic because um, I have a huge number of, of critters that have come from all over Texas as well. So this is up in the studio, this is the javelina. Let them dry. Okay, find a really good gallery <laughs> with nice, friendly people. And this brings me to say that I've got a couple of the people who have lent their gallery walls to this work before, including Terry Etherton, who's down here in the front row, who's come from Tucson, and um, Stephen Clark. <laughs> is, Steve, is Stephen here? Steve here? Oh, okay, because I want to say that Stephen's actually having an opening, a show of this work tomorrow at four o'clock. That's like a plug, <laughs> shameless plug. So. so Huh? Where you can buy it. Where you can buy it, yes. That being the point, yes. Um, anyway, uh, the other thing about you know, these wonderful galleries who, who do this, who have faith in this work, if you like, um, I get to be very good friends with them because they've got fabulous people who, who help me in the entire process, including Hannah Glasson right down there in the front row also, and um, Andrea Turner, who I don't think is here. Anyway. Um, okay, here we go. Anyway, and then your husband digs the holes <laughs> afterwards. And in fact, um, I've stopped burying the creatures because I figure um, it's best just to leave them out in the desert and something eats them and it's the whole cycle of life complete. So the other people that I've already been thanked that I'm going to thank again, people who have cursed me under their breath <laughs> at some point. <laughs> John Scott, who framed the whole thing, as David told you. <laughs> and Doug Watson, who, who you can see here down in the corner, who is measuring up the beginnings of that wall back there, who've done just a most fantastic job of getting this whole thing looking the way it looks uh, tonight. Thank you very much. And I hope you don't hate me for too long. <laughs> And also, I wanted to thank Harper's Magazine and Stacy, who, who's here. Where's Stacy Clarkson? Who um, a while about, a while ago commissioned me to go and do. Sorry, this is so low resolution. Uh, commissioned me to go actually do a bald eagle for Harper's Magazine for an article they did. And uh, actually, believe it or not, under this screen there is a bald eagle and I forgot that you weren't going to be able to see it. But um, it was quite an experience and it's one, obviously I think it's the very biggest of the photograms and it was wonderful to do and thank you very much. Okay, there was just a few silly details I was going to tell you um, when you see the book. This one is made using a spider and then I went to my wall sconces and I emptied them out <laughs> for the little bugs, which, and then I got some tweezers and I spaced them out carefully to make this picture. You'll see the book and it's, it's got lots of these sorts of things. Okay, so the last thing I'm going to say is the work back there I'm just going to explain to you and I'm going to show you uh, the consequence of getting excited about this uh, camera that we got uh, that I call the spy camera. It's called the truth camera, actually, believe it or not. And it's mostly used by hunters who are trying to see where game is. Um, and in fact, Bill Whitliffe uh, bought
bought one and put on his property and showed us the images that he got and I was just so excited about it that we went straight home and bought one ourselves and put it out in the desert knowing that we were going to get um, all sorts of things. So I'm just going to show you some more and I'm going to show you some of these sequences. This is the bobcat and it's obviously, so uh, with infrared the retinas of eyes glow like this which is why all the animals have these glowing eyes and this one clearly has a damaged eye because it's got that mark. Um, and so the, 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 the camera itself um, <coughs> records the time and the, the date and the time and the temperature, as a matter of fact. Um, so that's kind of exciting because when you go get the chip out of the camera and you plug it in, you can see exactly who's out there and what they're doing and what time it was, etc. So I was going to show you a few more. This is a rat running by. <laughs> This is, the, this is a very scary jackrabbit. I think this is actually... Uh, Monty Python did the uh, Holy Grail. Do you remember there was the rabbit? The, the, this is it. There he is again. Very scary. Okay, so I'm going to show you a sequence now. So I'm going to flip through these because what happens is this camera fires every three seconds once something uh, activates it with the motion. So the other night, this is literally the other day as you can see, um, here's a fox and here he is, he's looking at the camera and off he goes. And then a bit later he comes back with his friend. <laughs> so he says, come on, come over and see this thing. Okay, there they both go. And then they go back again. And then, oops, then the second one goes back again. Hang on. And then this is another sequence where there's, uh, we have javelina, lots of javelina. And this is a javelina bristling, and then the javelina comes towards the camera, charges the camera, and then you get this kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> and then here's a bobcat walking, walking by the camera, and I think the camera makes a little tiny sound, so the, the bobcat turns around, turns around, what the hell is that? <laughs> it comes back. And next, next he's on the camera, and then, as far as we know, he pees. <laughs> <laughs> on the camera. And then the off he goes again. So, here, now here's one of our favourite images, and in fact, Harper's Magazine are going to publish a, a small series of this work um, in their December issue, and this little fox. So clearly he has sight in one eye only because uh, the reflection of the infrared is only making one eye glow and he comes up to the camera and here he is housing a look and then he comes up and then off he goes but okay I think there's one more okay so this is my attempt to do a rattlesnake you see the rattlesnake there on the road this is actually cheating because I actually find the rattlesnake and then I put the camera in front of it <laughs> and I'm yet to get I'm yet to get a good rattlesnake picture. I'm hoping for something a bit more dramatic in this series. And here's another nice little series of little pack rat going on by. And here's another rattlesnake, another bobcat. I think that's actually all I've got for you. Oh, here's a sequence. So during the day, it's colour, uh, and during the night, it's black and white because it's infrared. But in the course of doing this, we get hundreds of thousands of rabbits and birds. So you actually have to sift through images to get the good ones but this is just a normal day in the life of the camera with these rabbits coming up and looking and going off anyway okay two other things because this is the end now I'm just going to tell you two other things you're all invited to my first um, cello ensemble recital um, except it's in Tucson and then the second thing is in the spirit of my uh, aunt uncle who are rescuers we have recently adopted a Sonoran Desert tortoise. Now, it's, it's not bleeding, it's just eaten a prickly pear fruit, which they love. And so that's what that is, it's just purple. So this is our, the, the, the new member of our family, whose name is Timothy, um, who's 10 and it will live to about 100 years old. And um, we actually have no idea whether he's yet male or he, she is yet male or female, because we won't know that for the other four or five years. And I just thought I'd leave you with that lovely image of a Sonora Desert tortoise. Okay, thank you.
what's it converting to? I have no idea. <laughs> Something. Okay. Doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Does anyone? Here, take your tequila. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So does anyone have any questions about how to make a photogram or anything else? No questions? Okay. Do you tell them how you and Martha... I mean, do it, you put the paper down, you get yes. the plexiglass. Uh, I mean, you know, go through. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, that's what my 10 easy steps were about. Weren't you paying attention, Bill? <laughs> uh, okay, so yes, it's easier to put the creature on a piece of plexiglass and then put the photographic paper down and put the whole piece of plexiglass on top rather than actually physically move the creature which is often not in great shape and, you know. So um, you make an exposure, you shine light on it, you lift the plexiglass back off, roll up the paper, process the paper. I mean, this is boring stuff. No, no one wants to know how to do this. But you would, these are additions. Yes, I do that several times over. So, so yeah. I've got more than, but they're all different because when you put the plexiglass down, I rearrange them. So obviously I rearrange, I arrange these animals a little bit. Um, you know, the snakes, etc. I make nice and cur curvy and so forth. N not very much, but basically I try and make them look their best. <laughs> and the fact that you have them on a piece of plexiglass makes the light wrap around oh, a little bit. It does, that happens anyway. Yeah. No, I don't think it's got to do with the plexiglass. I think it's got to do with uh, no, the nature of them being three-dimensional. I, I think I'm right. <laughs> <laughs> What do you think, Martha? <laughs> I think you're right. Oh, yes. Yeah, see? <laughs> 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 no, because they have a wonderful yes. effect. But 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 yes. 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 Well, that's because things like wings are semi translucent mm -hmm. and the light goes sort of through them. And if they've got fur, that's also less dense than their body. So I think anything three dimensional will, will get light lit around. <laughs> yes, okay. How long have you been doing this? You might have touched on that in the presentation. How long have you been doing this? This particular series? This, no, this particular technique. Oh. Uh, and what attracted you to it initially? Um, I've been doing this probably for about 10 years. But on and off, because I sort of do it in between other things and still it became a big body of work, which I then sort of focused on and did fairly seriously for the last few years. But I'm almost sort of better known for these big hand-coloured uh, portraits, head and shoulder portraits of birds, um, which I did for a very long time. So this was kind of a sideline thing for a while that then I did more seriously more recently. And as I said, I mean, everyone has done, and, and actually, um, because I was photographing critters to make these big portraits of them, I kind of, and I, I'd have leftover pieces of paper, and I thought sort of, what will I do just to use up this paper? So I'd put them down on the paper and made a, make a photogram, because this was something, as I said, that many, 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 many photographers have done since the, mid, the middle of the 1800s, right? Uh, so I sort of did it for fun, and then I realised I had a huge accumulation of them and that it became its own separate body of work. And then, as I said, what happened is this, when you start, you start, uh, the neighbours all say, I've got a dead bird or I've found a dead snake or, you know, and so it becomes this thing that's kind of a monster. <laughs> but anyway, anyway. Anyone else? Yes, Darden. <laughs> uh, because I, it, you know, I like it and it's fun, and I get opportunities like this, and I have to fill every last space. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you know, it's it's not it is work, but it's not work because it's what I love to do, and it's it's I'm a very lucky person for for that reason. I'm never bored. Thank you, Darden. <laughs> That's Darden Smith, everyone. <laughs> okay, yes. Will we get to see the eagle? Uh, yes, uh, you know, there's one out in the foyer too. So there's one in the foyer, and what we did, I hope everyone has noticed, 
we put the eagle, the bald eagle, with some rattlesnakes and some cactus pads, and you all know what that is. Yeah. Clever, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, there is a bald eagle under here, and yes, I think at some point you see it. Okay, is that it? It's my books now. Okay. Oh, sorry. I believe I read somewhere you, you touched something about the negative connotation of the term roadkill. I did what? I you, you touched about the negative connotation of the word roadkill. Did I? In light of these creatures, right? Maybe it was really is. But anyway, in, in that light, would you consider your acquisition of the creatures part of this art form that you do? And if so, what is the importance of where the creatures came from or how they died? It, not, not in the least, except that I think I'm very sad. Actually, I wrote a piece about the fact that I'm very sad about finding roadkill. I've, all my life, when I see a squirrel dead on the road, I feel extremely sad about that because it was just on its way back to its family and someone hit it in a car and there are too many cars and not enough consideration for the fact that we live with creatures. And So, yes, some, lots of this is roadkill, but lots of it is just found dead creatures. Again, I can't, I can't know how they died. I know, I know if they're on the side of the road, they were hit by a car, usually. But it's, so yes, this really is kind of a memorial, but it's not a memorial necessarily to the fact that they were killed that way. Do you know what I mean? Does, is that, uh, did that kind of answer your question? I was just curious if, if you consider um, the way that you acquire the creatures part of the form of art, like whether mm. if, it, if it had anything to do. No, I don't think so. I don't kill anything, no, <laughs> obviously. <laughs> some people think I do. I mean, some people actually think I go out there and kill them for this reason. <laughs> but what can you say? No, I've got like hate mails from organisations that say, you know. Like, anyway, it's weird. But. Um. A long time ago, someone wanted me to do a picture of their dead pet, and I just did a photograph of it for them. But no, I kind of, I don't want to get into that. I'm not into that. Don't, don't ask me to do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I actually thought it would be really fun to do um, live children, put children down on the <laughs> And make them stay. Wouldn't that be great? And huh? Or you? Or babies? Like drug them or wait till they were asleep or something, but do babies. Anyway. <laughs> what? Don't you think that would be cool? Little kids down there. <laughs> okay. Is that it? Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Oh, it, that actually varies a little bit, uh, and uh, f it depends actually how far your lens is that the, the pro projecting light to, yeah, the, the, you know what I'm saying, how far you're projecting light, and then what aperture you're u using in the lens that you're projecting the light with. So often to get the wraparound effect, um, which has nothing to do with the plexiglass. <laughs> <laughs> I, <laughs> I, I have the aperture open the whole way because that makes the light spill more, which means the light is spilling around the thing instead of being a single point source. And so, like a big thing like a Cody, the light source might be about five feet from it and the exposure is probably about um, eight to ten seconds. And then, actually, I didn't mention this, and it, it doesn't matter, it's a technicality, but uh, I, I fog the whole piece of paper afterwards so that when I process it, instead of being black and white, it's grey and white, so that when I tone it, it's yellow and dark brown, if that makes sense. So the fogging is just a few seconds. But it's usually arbitrary, you know, I mean, because some things get fogged more and some things get less, and you can see some of them are, are darker and lighter and so forth. Ten seconds. <laughs> but you could get a kid to stay still for ten seconds. <laughs>
Okay, is that it? I think that's it. Right. Yeah. Thanks. I thought we should end tonight just by saying, obviously, now you know what a brilliant photographer Kate is and what a brilliantly funny uh, <laughs> photographer Kate is. But she's also brilliantly generous. Uh, with a handful of exceptions, all of these works here tonight have been donated by Kate to the Whitliffe Collections. So. So thank you one and all for coming. We will have a book signing out at the table by the Whitliffe Collections logo. Thank you. <laughs>